Jesus, we ask that your presence would be here. Um, Holy Spirit, that you would move among us this morning and that you'd give us revelation and insight and understanding into your word. Lord, I pray that we would walk home with something birthed in us this morning, some new kind of faith, Lord, a, a rekindling of your spirit inside of us, Lord, that would bring light in the dark, that would shine and show us the way that you have for us. Holy Spirit, that you would come and be our counsel this morning. Come and encourage us and stir us up in the inside that we start to get an eternal vision of you and your kingdom instead of our circumstance. In the name of Jesus, amen. So uh, I'm a little bit nervous this morning because I'm really organized. So I got, I got my notes. I got a sermon title, The Dark Passage of Faith, and so it might be really bad this morning, I don't know, because normally I don't do that. So I'll be careful, and if it starts bombing, I'll discard the notes and we'll, we'll abort, abort. Um, so we'll, we'll see how it goes. We'll, we'll trust the Lord that uh, he can even use notes. So, uh, <laughs> so, um, so if you want to put your finger in Hebrews 11, we're going to read some in there this morning. Um, I am going to call the message... Uh, the dark passage of faith. We're trying to name the messages only for the purpose on YouTube. There's like 50 videos that just say January 4th, and no one knows what that sermon's about. So um, we're going to try to, and, and that's my fault because I normally don't name them. Um, so we'll try to start doing that to cue people's memory because we have a lot of people starting to watch online. So, so I want to talk about a little bit about the patriarchs, and, and I know we've been camping on Noah a little bit, and we're going to briefly talk about Noah and then move on, because um, uh, I saw the movie recently twice and going to see it again, because um, I, I liked it. Uh, so what, what, I, what I really enjoy uh, about the story of Noah and what I want you guys to, to take from it, if you do see the movie, the thing that stood out for me the most is that Noah doesn't just instantly get this download from God with all the details. Now, just so we can talk about it, let's, let's go to um, the Bible in Genesis 6 where, where it does tell the story over a couple of chapters. Uh, the, the writers are pulling from Midrash, they're pulling from uh, pseudepigraphal books, they're pulling from Book of Enoch, Book of Adam, uh, the, uh, the Watchers, uh, they're pulling from these different sources to come up with the movie. So it's not exactly, obviously, what occurs here, but it makes for a really good story. And I think overarching, you have to say what comes out of the show is people, especially Noah, having faith in God, and in the end, that Noah's choosing, um, he's choosing love and grace over violence and death, and that ends up being the right decision which God blesses. So that, that's what I loved, and I love that tons and tons and tons of unbelievers are going to watch a movie about God, so I think it's really cool. Anyways, so we often, uh, when, we, when we talk about the story of Noah, we, we read it or we learn it when we're children. And so I'll just read what it says here in verse 5 of chapter 6. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of men was great on the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only continually evil. The Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth and he was grieved in his heart. And the Lord said, I will blot out men whom I've created from the face of the land from man to animals and creeping things to birds of the sky, for I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord, and these are the records of generations. So skip down to 13. Then God said to Noah, the end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence because of them. And behold, I am about to destroy the whole earth. Um, make for yourself an ark of gopher wood, and you shall make the ark with rooms, and it shall cover the inside with pitch, inside and out. This is how you shall make it, the length of the ark, 300 cubits, its breadth, 50, and its height, 30 cubits. You shall make a window for the ark and finish it to a cubit from the top, and he goes on. So we, we get this, this kind of oracle of God that comes down and speaks to Noah. We often hear of other people or patriarchs in the Old Testament that received uh, a command from God or they hear God's voice and, and they actually do something. In the movie, it depicts Noah hearing from God in a dream, which could have very well happened. The majority of the time in the Old Testament that God speaks is through dreams. It's not through audible voice, it's through dreams. 
Now, we assume by the way this is written that this was an audible voice. I can't argue that it's not, but it may well not be. It may have been that Noah had a dream from the Lord, or God might have spoken to him. Now, what I want and and what I want to lay out as kind of the problem is that when we look back into Old Testament patriarchs that Hebrews 11 talks about in a minute, these patriarchs of faith, we see them as these men who just kind of wake up one morning and God comes down in some kind of form or cloud or glory or angels or there's lightning and light and glory and he goes, Noah. Noah goes, who are you? And he's like, I am powerful. He's like, clearly you're glowing. And so there's, there's this, wow, like you're God and I should listen because I've never seen a shiny person before and you seem to like be scary. So, you, you, you know, I should listen. And he goes, I want you to build an ark because I'm going to destroy mankind. And so you, but you have to kind of go back into Noah's day and go, there's no Bible. You know, Noah doesn't go to his Bible study Wednesday night and going, the weirdest thing happened to me this week. This shiny guy came down and said, build a boat, everyone's going to die. And everyone in the Bible says, going, well, we'll have to pray over that word. That seems a bit odd that, you know, God's going to kill everybody because that would include us. And so we don't know if we like that word. And so he's got nobody to kind of bounce it off, Right. I love what uh, this one comedian jokes around about Abraham, you know, coming to his wife and and, uh, saying, you know, God's told me that I'm supposed to kill Isaac. And she's like, yeah, I don't know about that. She's like, I'm not really sure, you know. She goes, you just listen to everything God says. Like if God said jump off a bridge, you'd jump off a bridge. If if God said to circumcise yourself, you would just cut it off. And he goes, well, actually, I got to talk to you about that too. (laughs) You know, so it's, it's like, you know, it, 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 some of the things of God can sound crazy, right? They sound unbelievable, and so you, you'd like to kind of bounce that off somebody. And so we read this as if, and I'm saying as if God comes down in some kind of bright, shiny chariot way or thunderous voice, communicates to Noah, gives him the instructions of the ark, and he just goes and does it. The issue I have with that is that in Hebrews 11, it calls these men of God and men of, or women of God in the Old Testament that they were patriarchs of faith. And I imagine that if God showed up in my bedroom one night or would have done so five years ago and said, Matthew, I am God and I want you to plant a church and it's going to struggle along for the first five years and this is going to happen and some people will come and some people will go, but keep your trust in me because it's going to be this great thing. And he opened up my eyes and I had a vision and he teleported me to the place where there were thousands worshiping. I'd go, okay, and I'd just get on with it because I would know that's going to happen. But faith is messier than that. It's not as clear cut as that often. Sometimes we don't know how it's going to end. We have a hope, we have a belief, but we don't know how it's going to turn out. It would really take the fun out of meeting a potential girl, or if you're a girl, a guy, a a, a mate, if you just knew everything that was going to happen before it was going to happen. Part of the thrill is, you know, when when you'd go up to a girl and ask her for a phone number because you thought she was pretty, which is completely wrong and shallow, but, you know, that's what guys do. So it's like, I'm attracted to you. So, so I would like your phone number because I'd like to call you and see more of you because I'd like to look at your beauty. So I, if I could have your phone number. So, so when we, we go and we ask that question, we don't know what that girl's going to say because you could just get shot down. You're like, I, I, I don't want to give you my number. Would you like to go out for dinner with me? I wouldn't even like to share a meal with you. How about a donut? Not even a donut. I, I don't want to be seen in public with you. So, you know, you, you, you are scared that you could get shot down. So it makes the experience tense, right? So the, the elation is, is that when you say, could I have your number? And they go, sure, let's go out sometime. You're like, really? You know, and so there's kind of this excitement that you just can't believe that just happened because there's an anticipation because you don't know what's going to happen, which makes life exciting. It makes it nerve-wracking and exciting. But if God removed the faith out of the world and we just knew everything and we saw everything, A, there would be no joy and B, we wouldn't grow. We wouldn't develop because God's got greater things for us than just in this life. 
And obviously, and I don't know what they are, but obviously the development of faith is key or else God would just tell us exactly what he wants us to do all the time and be really, really clear about it. But God doesn't mind you fumbling along the way. He doesn't mind you messing up as you're trying to figure it out. You see, even, even when we, we start this church and I do things and we've made mistakes on the, along the way, we've made some small ones and we've made some big ones and we just keep fumbling, but God's just so happy we're doing it. God's just so happy that you're trying to build his kingdom and, and he knows you're human and you get in fear and you get in worry and you do things that are wrong, but you just keep going and he's just cheering us on that we keep going. It's okay that you made a mistake. What did you learn from that? Well, I learned not to do this. And the Lord goes, good, we learned that, so we won't do that anymore. And then you do it again. And the Lord goes, okay, so that was bad again, right? Yeah, it was bad again. And what did you learn? I learned not to do it again. And then we do it again. And the Lord goes, okay, you did that again. You, like you did it like three times. And there's a pattern of dumbness here. So why do you think you keep doing the dumb thing? And like, Lord, I think I've got a root of fear or worried that people are going to hurt me. Right, that's what we want. We're telling you at time one, but you weren't ready to hear it. So I've seen you screw up these three times. And now what's come out is a pattern of dumbness. So we know there's a problem, and we know we've got to heal that problem so you don't keep doing dumb stuff. Okay, Lord, heal me. Awesome. And then the next time you do it right, the Lord goes, good. See, we healed that. We fixed that. No more dumb stuff. We're on to the next dumb thing you're going to do. And he's okay with that. He's good with that. Most of us are just paralyzed, though. We're so scared we're going to do the wrong thing or get out of the will of God. Just assume you already are. Just assume you're already doing dumb stuff. You're probably out of the will of God in lots of areas of your life. But he's thrilled with you. He loves you. And he's pulling you into his will. So it's going to be messy. And you're going to fumble the ball. And you're going to screw up. And you're going to make mistakes. But he would rather you make mistakes than do nothing at all. He'd rather you attempt to believe something than never believe anything. You know, sometimes when I've prayed for my kids when they've been sick, and I've prayed over them, oh, Lord, heal them. And, you know, and I quote this verse and that verse, and they get sicker. But I have to be willing to risk to at least pray in, in the journey to learn about how do we heal the sick. Because, you know, I'm, I'm about 99% unsuccessful. But, you know, the, the last 1% of success and healing has come in these last couple of years. We've started to see more people getting healed, and more people getting delivered from things. So, so I, and the 1% is actually a nice, big, fat chunk because the, I've prayed so many times and not seen success. But I'm learning more about the goodness of God and the grace of God. See, there's no sense when I pray for somebody if I absolutely don't believe anything's going to happen, which is usually how I pray. You know, my kids are sick, and, you know, and I'm, I'm like giving them Tylenol while I'm praying for them. I'm like, I know this isn't going to work, so here's the Tylenol. Dear Jesus, we just ask that by your holy presence and your love and your, you know, and, I, and, and so usually we just pray long, you know, in hopes that that's going to work. The longer I pray, the more effectual it will be. And Jesus often, when he healed people, just said a single word. Stand up. Be healed. Open your eyes. Your leprosy's gone. Single words. Just phrases that he would say. We're like, oh, dear God. And we get the whole prayer team. Pray in tongues for a while. Warm up. That's our warm up. You know, getting our faith going. Get the faith muscles pumping. All right, all right. We got a sweat happening. Okay, we're ready. Okay, sit down. All right. And then we all lay our hands on. And, and then we all take turns praying. And we try to outpray the other guy. to get more wisdom, more insight. And just like now. And how do you feel? The person's like, not good. And tired and sweaty now and hot from all you. <laughs> people praying for me. But the good news is that we keep trying. And as we try, we learn. Because you, there's other people who go, I, I, that's not going to work. And they sit back and they learn nothing. And they're never getting closer. And Micah, the other night, we came home and, uh, and, and he was really nauseous. He was sitting on the stairs and he's just like, oh, I'm going to barf. And we're like, oh, great. There, there goes our night. So we think he's going to be up all night barfing. And, and the Lord's been teaching me some new things about praying and, and, and healing. And, and, and so I remembered, because Victoria's like, go get him some gravel. And so I went and got the gravel. And I remembered just the other week saying to you guys, the next time you go to reach for a pill, maybe try praying first. And I thought, yeah, maybe the leader should start there. <laughs> yeah, is that good? Yeah, I thought, I, I should do what I'm preaching. That would be good. So... 
So I put the gravel down because um, I thought I'd experiment on Micah's nausea instead of mine. <laughs> so, no. so I, uh, he, he was laying in bed, and I, I just laid my hands on him, and I, and I just started to pray with him and say, God, just grace and peace, grace and peace to his body. I said, Jesus, you, you bore his sickness on the cross. So Jesus, would, and often we do that, Lord, I give you my sickness, I give you my ailment, but we don't exchange it for anything. And at the cross, there's a beautiful exchange happening. He took on our infirmities and our sickness and gave us life, gave us a garment of praise, gave us healing. And so I think often we pray the sickness off, but we don't pray any healing in, and I just don't think we get better. And so I was saying, Lord, would you exchange his nausea, and when you put it on yourself and give him how your stomach feels, how your peace, the peace that's in you, would you implant that in him and take him and exchange exchange and bring him grace and peace so i said to him how are you feeling he goes, uh, he goes a little bit better i'm like yeah that didn't work <laughs> so i was gonna go get the pills and i thought no i'll give it a few more minutes he'll be fine so a few more minutes i went in how are you doing he goes i think a little bit better i said okay so then we went in the room i read for a while and came out actually i think i was playing angry birds but <laughs> <laughs> sounded better to say i was reading studying for my sermon. <laughs> so, I, so I came back in, and, and he was fast asleep. And he woke up. He didn't throw up that night and didn't get better. And I'm like, that worked. That worked. Okay, that worked. Remember that that worked. And so part of faith is, I don't know if it's going to work, but I don't know if I don't try. There's other things I've prayed and they don't work at all. I'm like, okay, scratch that off the list because you have to experiment. You have to grow. So back to Noah. I think the problem is, is when we start to believe, and this will really honestly have a part two of this message. I know the other week I said that the Timothy thing, but then I graphed it up at the end, but this will, because there's too much information to cover today. I, I will, I, I will. Unless the Lord gives me brand new revelation this week, then I might get greedy and share that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So when, when we're talking about Noah, the, the problem we have when we look back at those stories is we think that God just showed up and said everything all at once. And so there's no struggle. There's nothing really to believe. God just gives them it all and he just follows out the commands. But I want to illustrate for you what may have happened. And the reason I take liberty in this story, because this is conjecture. I can't say that this happened. So I'm going to take a bit of liberty. The reason I'm going to take the liberty is because I see this process happening in David's life. I see the process happening in Joseph's life. I see the process happening in Abraham's life. And I see the process happening in Moses' life. And I see the process happening in the prophet's life. And I see that process happening in Jonah's life and in Jesus' life. The process of not knowing all at once and having to grow in faith towards God. It seems like they all go through it, but Noah seems to get the full download. And that's why I think sometimes when we're telling story, when we're writing narrative, even ourselves, we compile the information. Clearly, a worldwide flood that took them 100 years to build a boat, 150 days on the ark gets compressed into about 70 or 80 verses. So that's really not the full account, is it? It's not really the full story because the story is very long, stretch over a long period of time. But when Moses writes the story of Noah, they're a few years apart, right? Like hundreds and hundreds of years apart from Moses to Noah, right? There's a, there's a long distance between those two men. And so Moses is writing the story of Noah inspired by the Holy Spirit and saying, so in this day, God spoke to Noah and said these things. Now, uh, let me, let, let's just be clear. Moses has no clue how God spoke to Noah. He just knows God did. He doesn't know how, so he doesn't make the conjecture. He just says God spoke to Noah. He doesn't know if it's a dream or a vision or an audible voice, but it doesn't say an audible voice. We have other passages where there is an audible voice. Samuel, remember Samuel? God speaks and says, Samuel. And those are very, very few occasions actually in the Old Testament where anybody hears the audible voice of God. It's rare. So, When Moses is writing the story, he doesn't give us all the details because how God said it, when God said it, isn't important. The the, the importance is that the world comes under a deluge, that God redeems mankind, starts again with eight people, and, and that's the story. 
This, the story is God's covenant with the rainbow that I'll never destroy the earth again. Those are the highlights, and, and Moses is giving us highlights. But for the purpose of teaching on faith, the writer of Hebrews, which is possibly Luke, or which was Paul's companion, it, we, we get a little bit more detail of the story of people of faith. So I, I want to give you an example. I believe that quite possibly, and that this happens with so many of us, that no one might have had a vision for the Lord or a dream or had an inclination of the Spirit of God speaking to him. And it had to be profound, or else you probably wouldn't build a boat. It had to be something large enough for him to be very stirred. It wasn't just the wind was blowing one day and he had a hunch he should build an ark. That's not what I'm saying. We have the Holy Spirit now to communicate those kind of things to us, but in that day they didn't have the Holy Spirit in the same way. So it would have had to be a dream or a vision or possibly an audible voice. But I believe that God would have said, Noah, I have found favor with you. Maybe a prophet even came to Noah. I don't know. But I have found favor with you, and I'm going to destroy mankind, and I need you to build a boat. And I think that was the bulk of their conversation. And I think in the times after that, Noah probably woke up Tuesday morning, because God for sure spoke to Noah on Sundays. That's why you should come to church. So, (laughs) So God spoke to him. And so Monday he wakes up, and he's like, so what do I do now? Like, God's told me to do something. I'm not sure what to do. So I think he probably got up and said, dear creator, what would you have me do today? And he's like, go into the forest and get wood. Okay. Gets his sons, goes into the forest, starts chopping down wood, brings the wood back. Creator, what would you have me to do today? I need you to mark out the ark. I need it to be 500 cubits or feet this way and 80 feet this way. Hmm. Okay. Well, that's interesting. We should maybe make a model of that boat. Like maybe we'll make a little ark and we'll stick it in some water and see what happens, see if it floats. And so they, they start to build a little ark and they're like, wow, look at that. It worked. God's word was right. That, that seems to work. Let's build that boat. So they begin to mark it out. And, and then they're like, how are we going to put this whole thing together? I don't know how we're going to put this thing together. And then the Lord speaks to him and says, he says, God, how am I going to put this whole thing together? You know, 3M doesn't exist yet. We don't have any glue. So I don't, I don't know how we're going to build this boat. And he's like, I want you to get tar and pitch, and I want you to melt it down out of the trees, and then you're going to use it and apply it to the whole boat. Oh, good, okay. And how high should we make this boat? Lord, how high should we make this boat? And the Lord gives him instruction. And this is going on after year after year after year. Now, when I go back and I tell that narrative, I just go, God spoke to Moses or Noah and said, build the ark like this and use pitch and use wood and do this because I don't, I don't know the detail of all those days. I just know the great thing. And so it is in our lives. When the Lord asks us to start this church, he he doesn't give me everything all at once because I don't have the faith for all that. He keeps us on a need-to-know basis so that we continue in relationship with him and keep asking him questions. Let me illustrate this by by talking about David. Um, Go to uh, Psalm 22 if you have it in your Bibles. Now, I want you to remember that David is anointed king of Israel by Samuel. He anoints him. He pours oil over him. And he says, you're going to be the next king. David's pretty excited about that. He kills Goliath. He thinks, man, my life's going. Israel's singing my praises. I laid some smack down on that giant. I got his head to prove it. It's a trophy. He wears it around his neck on a big chain. You know, he's like, I'm David. Look what I did. And he thinks his life's going pretty good. Everybody really loves him. He's like saved the the nation of Israel. He's still oily because he's never washed his hair. You know, he wants to keep that anointing on. Him and Samuel hanging out there on a first name basis. David, Sam, how's it going? You know, and they they know each other and he feels pretty cool about that because this is a prophet of God who's hanging out with David. But then it goes sideways. David ends up in a cave, hungry. Everybody's rejected him. Saul's out trying to murder him in the middle of the night, and he's like cold and lost, doesn't know where God is. He's like, this isn't what I imagined for my life. This, I, I thought I was supposed to be in king, and God was going to deal with Saul, and I was going to take his place, and everybody was going to love me, and I was going to have a real successful life in ministry. But here I am in a cave, alone, with a couple of men who've trusted in me, and I'm being pursued for my life. And so David writes in Psalm 22, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? 
Now, he probably doesn't know at the time that he's prophesying about Jesus. Far from my deliverance are the words of my groaning. Oh, my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer. And by night, but I have no rest. Yet you are holy. O oh, you who are enthroned upon the praises of Israel. In you our fathers trusted. They trusted you and you delivered them. To you they cried out and were delivered. In you they trusted and were not disappointed. But I am a worm and not a man. A reproach of men and despised by the people. All who see me sneer at me. They separate with the lip and they wag their heads saying, Commit yourself to the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him because he delights in him. Yet you are he who brought me forth from the womb. You made me trust upon my mother's breast. Upon you I was cast from birth. You have been my God from my mother's womb. Be not far from me, for trouble is near. For there is none to help me. Many bulls have surrounded me. Strong bulls of Bashan have encircled me. They open wide their mouth at me as ravening and roaring lion. As a raving and roaring lion. I am poured out like water and all my bones are out of joint. And he starts to prophesy about Jesus. But he is distraught. That, that's, a, that's, a, that's not a prayer of faith. David clearly wasn't raised in the word faith movement. He was having negative confessions there. You are far from me. I am lost. He, this, this, this boy is full of negative confession. No wonder why he's in that cave. That's kind of how we treat people. No wonder you're in such a mess. Look at how, what you confess. You confess your mess, so you're in a mess. You've got to start speaking positive things. Now, I, I believe we should speak positive things and not speak death over our lives, but it's, that, that's just too of a simple equation. David's having a hard time. He feels lost. He feels alone. And the vision of him supposed to be a king is starting to fade away. But, he says, but the men of old, and he would have been thinking about Noah. You spoke to Noah. You got through to Noah, and he built that ark, and you saved him. And you got through to Abraham, and he had a son, and that's why I'm here. And you spoke to Joseph, and you spoke to Jacob, and you spoke to Moses. And so I can trust that you spoke to all those other men in a way and they fumbled and they, and they messed up. Abraham, the same thing. He gets a promise that he's going to have a child. And so his response is an awesome, Lord, I totally believe you. And so him and Sarah go into the tent to produce a child. No, Sarah's actually laughing in the tent like, yeah, right, I'm like a hundred. And I mean, like God shows up that time. It's two angels and the angel of the Lord or the Lord or the pre-incarnate Christ, whatever you want to believe, but something's there that's godly. And says, you're going to have a, a baby. And they hear her laughing in the tent. <laughs> they go, why are you laughing? Oh, I heard a funny joke. It wasn't at you. And she <laughs> tries to get out of it. But the fact is, she's not really believing in that moment. She doesn't really believe in that moment. But yet, that's not what the book of Hebrews says about her. It says she had faith. So is the writer of Hebrew confused about the oral tradition that's passed down for millennia to him? No. Because God's not focusing on her laughter in that moment because it was ridiculous in the moment to her. Do you know that as a patriarch of faith, Abraham stands above the rest, and yet this guy lies about his wife, says it's his sister because he's not really believing God, and then he goes and essentially in our day and age, he commits an adultery, he commits adultery with another woman to have a baby. Now, it's all under Sarah's permission, which is weird, but she's like, well, I'm old, so take this young thing, and I'm sure you can have a child with her. And Noah's like, well, think, okay, you know. <laughs> Did I say Noah? Abraham. I don't think he debated that long. Well, if you insist. So he goes and has a baby with Hagar, but what's interesting is the writer of Hebrews doesn't mention that. It says that Abraham was unwavering in his faith and believed that God would give him a son. That he was unwavering in his faith. And yet, he sleeps with Hagar and has Ishmael, which wasn't God's design. And yet, the writer of Hebrews doesn't even mention it. Because it doesn't focus on where he didn't have faith. It focuses on where he did and he realizes that this is probably not it. And then later, Sarah gets pregnant and has his child, Isaac. You know what's fascinating, too, is that when God says, I want you to offer your son up to me, 
I believe Abraham probably misunderstood him, but he, he takes Isaac up on the mountain, and, he's, and, and he, he leaves his three servants, it says, behind. And he says, the boy and I are going to go up in the mountain, and we will return. He knows God's asked him to sacrifice Isaac in his thought, that he is going to kill him. But he actually believes, as Hebrews says, that God could even raise him from the dead. So he anticipates that they are both coming home. And he says to his servants, I will return with him, that we will come back, not I. We will come back. So he believed that even if he was going to finish through and have to sacrifice his son, that God would raise him up and deliver him. This is an archetype of Jesus and the sacrifice that was made there. But God doesn't focus on the mistake he made with Hagar. The writer of Hebrews focuses on that he is a champion of faith because he believed God even unto death, hoping in a resurrection. That he believed that when he went up the mountain. He believed it when he put Isaac up there. He believed it when he pulled out the knife. He believed it when he was coming down and when the Lord stopped him. He believed, even till the end, that God could even raise him up. And so... We bumble and we fumble and we make mistakes and we try to figure out God's will. Oh, I'm going to have a son. Oh, this seems like the easiest way to make that happen. Early on when we were in the Lutheran church, as our church, there was a little church across the parking lot, as most of you remember. It was a little Presbyterian church and we found out that the whole church was falling apart and they were were going to sell the building. And we were like, thank you, Lord, perfect. So we, uh, which is maybe a bit fleshy, but we were so excited because it was right there. And so I got everybody to start praying that we'd get that church. And it only like seated 100 people, but it was great for us because we'd have a building. And we went, I got everybody, and we walked around, and we marched around and prayed in the parking lot. And I'm leading everybody to do this. And we had a prayer meeting about it, and we're claiming that building. We laid hands on the building, and we totally didn't get the building. Another Reformed church that preaches exactly opposite to what I teach, they got the building. I said, well, Lord, I, 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 I missed you. I, I thought you wanted to give us a church building. And the Lord said, I do want to give you a church building. Just not that one. It's not big enough. Oh. Oh, so not that one. No. I, I, all I said is I want to give you a building, and you thought it was that one. And Victoria had said to me before, do, do you think it's that building, or do you think it's just easy because it's there, and so because you can see it, you believe it? Because that's not faith. Faith is, you can't even see it, but you believe God's going to give you a building. That building won't even fit you. You you are like settling for something small, and I want to give you something big, and this is too little. You need to improve your vision. Oh, okay, Lord. And as I'm learning God, I'm learning what to believe. I'm learning that it's bigger usually than what I think. I think small, God thinks big. And so the Lord goes, I want you to believe more. It's not that I'm withholding you this because it's good. I have something more good than this. I have something better than this. So I want you to believe better. But God wasn't mad. God didn't take me and discipline me. And God goes, now you need pneumonia for a month because you led my people astray. You know, God doesn't do that. We just learned. Now, I was a bit embarrassed, but I got over it because we're here. We go, okay, that wasn't the Lord. But I wouldn't have known if we didn't try because we might have got the building. And you know, the next time we will. So God doesn't mind. He's not angry when we miss his will, when we make mistakes. He's just happy we're trying. Because a lot of people don't even believe God for a building. They just, they just have building programs in their church and keep begging for money and tell everybody to put a second mortgage on their home. Well, that's not faith. That's not belief. That's in our own effort and our own striving trying to make things happen. So at least we tried in faith. God goes, good. I just have to expand your faith. You're right. I want you to pray for this. You're praying for the wrong thing. I can't answer it this way, but I will answer it. I can't do it this way. There are times I would meet girls and I think, oh, that would be a good wife. Oh, Lord, you know, just cause her to break up with her current boyfriend and just give me a shot here and, you know, give me the words to say and the poems to speak and, Lord, just help me. The right kind of flowers. It was the poems. I didn't know that. That's so sweet that you'd say. No, there was no poems. There was one. Um, so, you know, we, we, we pray those kind of things, or, or I do. You might pray other things. <laughs> and, so, and so you're praying that, and, and then it didn't happen. And the Lord goes, 
you, do, you have no idea what you're asking. You don't know anything about this woman, and you will thank me one day that I didn't answer that prayer. There's a song years ago called Thank God for Unanswered Prayer. Thank the Lord that you don't answer some of my prayer requests, that I don't get what I actually ask for because I don't know. I ask in man's wisdom and understanding and foolishness. But God's still excited that we're praying. He still wants us to pray and to ask because in that he guides us, in that he teaches us. So know that David, while he's struggling, he says, okay, I'm struggling. I don't know where you are. I'm having a hard time. I feel lost. I don't feel I've hit where I'm supposed to be, but I know that you're good. But I know that you've spoken over my life, and I believe it. I don't know how you're going to do it. I don't know when you're going to do it, but I'm going to keep the faith. I'm going to keep the faith that you're good. I'm going to keep the faith that you can rescue me. I'm going to keep the faith that you are a true God, that you are full of grace and mercy and compassion, that you have hope for me and a future for me. I'm going to choose to believe that despite where I am right now. And if you are sick or you are broke, then you just say, Lord, I am not feeling well in my body. Lord, my finances are a mess. Lord, my marriage is a mess, but I believe you are good. I know you're good, and I know you will lead me, and I know you will teach me as I abide in you, and as I continue to keep faith in you that you are good, you will lead me home. You will lead me home. I'm going to finish with the words, and then we'll continue on next week. The Jason Gray song, and then we're, we'll sing it one more time. The song is a way to see in the dark. We sang it at the beginning. It says, here I am begging for certainty again, but simple trust is what you're asking me to give. Isn't that interesting? We want certainty. God wants trust. We want to know what's going to happen. God says, I want you to trust me and I will take care of it. But Lord, I want to know, when am I going to meet my spouse? When am I going to have that relationship? Lord, when are you going to give me a job? When are you going to fulfill my calling? Lord, when are you going to grow my church? Lord, when are you going to launch me into ministry? Lord, when are you going to heal my sickness? Lord goes, you don't need to know when. You need to know you need to trust me. You don't need to know when. When does it matter? When is contingent upon the time that you spend with me? When is how much of me I can get in you so you trust me and not be in fear? That's when. When is when I've had sufficient time to work my grace and my love and my kindness into you because you are destroying things in front of you, but you don't even know. Your fear is wrecking things. Your pride is wrecking things. Your, the disease of sin in your life wrecks things in front of you, but I'm trying to heal you so if you'd abide with me, I could heal you so those things could come so I can't tell you when because when is unknown. But what I can tell you is you can trust me. And if you come to me, you can trust me because I will heal you. You can trust me. I want you to have a good life. You can trust me. I want to deliver you. You can trust me. I want to heal you. You can trust me. So come to me so you can trust me. And I will work these things into you and I will make your life glorious. So he's not going to give you certainty. This is why the Bible is not a book of moral commands and codes. The Bible is a book to teach us about how to walk and hear the voice of God, to walk in the Spirit. The Bible is about a book to teach us how to be in relationship, not this is what you do in this situation, this is what you do in that situation. There's no such thing as what would Jesus do, like there's a right thing. The question is what would you do in trusting God? It's not what would Jesus do. Jesus is in you. What would you do? What would you do? Will you trust God? Jesus already trusts God. You need to trust God. And if you can't trust God, say, God, I don't trust you. I had a horrible childhood. My dad abused me. My dad wasn't a good guy. My mom wasn't a good guy. I don't trust you. That's my problem. Then you say, Jesus, give me trust. Give me a gift of trust so I can begin to trust you, and he will give it to you. If I am saved, he said, you will tell me it will not be by sight. So when I pray, I close my eyes. I love that. You're telling me it's not by sight, it's by faith. So when I pray, I close my eyes. Because it's not what I see, it's when, what's in the unseen. It's God what you see. So I close my eyes to get a vision of you and what you're seeing. And don't look around me to the distractions, which are my loneliness, my bills, my addiction, my problems, my sickness, my weight, whatever my issue is. I don't look at those things. So when I pray, I close my eyes. I'll reach for your hand in the night. 
when the shadows swallow the light because I'm giving up, I'm giving in. Once again, a childlike faith is the only way to see in the dark. The question mark hung at the end of every fear is answered by the promise that you are with me here and that's all I've got when the lights go out and I lose my way. So I'll close my eyes and I won't be afraid. I'll reach for your hand in the night when the shadows swallow the light because I'm giving up, giving in. If every star falls and the sun fails to rise, still in my blindness I'll see. If you are my help, my hope, and my vision, one step at a time you will lead. So I reach for your hand in the night when the shadows swallow the light because I'm giving up, giving in. Once again, a childlike faith is my only way to see in the dark. And God wants to give you night vision. He wants you to be able to see in the dark. And the only way you're going to do that so you won't be afraid is to close your eyes, to focus in on him, to go and abide with him and feel his presence and let it guide you. And don't be afraid that you will make mistakes because he won't be angry with you and he's not disappointed with you and he loves you and he has a hope for you and a future for you that is more beautiful than you can imagine, but it requires that you trust him. Amen? Let's play the song.